come once again to discuss things. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Geeky Gentlemen. I am Sid Pardue. Joining me today is... Me, Steve. And Rasko. Indeed, they are. Uh, Rasko chose our review topic tonight. Rasko, what are, what are we reviewing tonight? We are reviewing The Counselor. Indeed. Um... Okay, so Rasko has this really aggravating habit of picking boring, slow, bad movies for us to review <laughs> just so that I can, like, sit here and complain about them the whole time. Um, like, he, he knows he's doing it. He does it on purpose. Uh, <laughs> but about. Steve usually, like, slinks his little ass out of these. So, Steve, what do you think of The Counselor? Um... The fuck was this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So, so Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott's a weird guy because I feel like he has a lot of talent, but he also thinks he's a lot smarter than he actually is. Um, case in point, if you listen to him talk about Blade Runner, I don't think he actually understands what Blade Runner is about, but... He's so full of all of the praise Blade Runner gets that he makes shit like Alien Covenant, which if you think about it for more than two seconds on any philosophical level, it makes no fucking sense at all. Um, and so, like, I, I, I'm tempted to give him slack because it, clearly he he knows how to shoot things really well. He hires really great actors almost all the time. But even in his good movies, he has this habit of making some of my favorite actors really, really boring um this is michael fassbender is my favorite actor working right now god is he boring in this <laughs> he's so boring except for that one scene where he has that breakdown at the end he's so boring um this isn't an awful movie i don't think i just think that it's one too full of itself two entirely too dry and three really bizarrely convoluted by the end yeah i mean you know how crazy is it that you would describe a movie with two pet cheetahs in it as dry right 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 <laughs> Rasko... and also just just for the sake of like mentioning the pet cheetahs like this cast is massive and bizarre and doesn't make any sense and you think it'd be nothing but fun like an eddie wright movie and it's not okay. it's not at all <laughs> Rasko, what do you think of this movie? Or, or better yet, why did you choose this movie beyond pissing me off? Um, I'll be completely honest. This was a total, like, I wanted to piss Ian off, but I had also heard, like, I'd wanted to watch this movie. I hadn't seen it yet. So I watched it, and then I was like, okay, this fits right in line with some of these movies I've been picking. It was entirely to piss you off. I'll be completely honest, dude. <laughs> that being said, I think this movie is actually... It's it's a marvel in, in this particular way. Here's what it is. This is perhaps the most boring movie ever made, but <laughs> it it's somehow not the worst movie ever made. It's true. It's <laughs> while weird. being the most boring. And you I think that I there's do. a magic there that we have to stop and really think about and admire. We really do, honestly, because that's really awesome. <laughs> Rasko, to get you back, I'm just going to pick, like, the, the movie Paint Drying, because there's this really <laughs> fascinating story. In, in America, we have the MPAA, and it's all bullshit, but in Britain, they have their own version of it. But it's even more bullshit, because you have to pay a committee to watch your film before you can get a rating from that committee. And I think it's, like, $5,000 per hour, so it really undercuts, you know, indie filmmaking and, and indie distributing and so as a protest of that, a guy did a, um online fundraising thing 
to make a film and get it submitted and he raised enough money to make that committee watch an eight hour film of paint drying on a wall because legally they have to watch every second of your movie after you pay the the, uh, fee and so I I just kind of want to get back at Rasco and pick that and just sit here and review that fucking movie (laughs) if you pick that i'm going to use that card that we get on geeky gentleman that we don't typically get in other things which is i'll say i couldn't finish it and that'll be my review yeah yeah uh and like okay so this movie oddly did not piss me off nearly as much as like inherent vice or (laughs) or the witch or or any of the, the awful movies that Rasko likes to pick. Oh my god, The Witch is great. Shut I up. I like You're The wrong Witch. About the witch. Yeah, well, I really like The Witch. I don't <laughs> give a fuck. I didn't. That's all I care about. Um, you know, but like Rasko likes to do this. He likes to pick these really high minded, you know, film films and like, man, I don't know what it is about filmmaking that these these directors get into, but like. They don't know how to make a, a movie that you can just watch, man. I don't understand that. Like, what... Is there some kind of joke that I'm not in on on, like, getting people to just sit through the longest possible movie ever? Like... <laughs> God. The sad part is... The sad part is... It's only, like, 117 minutes. It's yeah. really not that long. It's just yeah. so fucking boring. <laughs> Yeah, this movie is like a sponge, but somehow it is like doesn't absorb anything. And you're, <laughs> the water is your mind trying to get into this movie and like really get into it and be soaked in by it. And it's like this sponge that can't absorb water. And you're just like, what is this movie even about? And you, I've watched it a few times now and I kind of get like some vague ideas but this is one of those movies where you can watch the entire movie and never know who like what anyone is what they're talking about like what yep. anyone's career is maybe michael fassbender that's the only character that maybe if you watch this and you didn't that's pick up on his like, name is his job <laughs> yeah outside of that you're there's like really this movie you could show it to someone and ask them what it's about and they could literally have no idea i mean i i, I wouldn't even go that far i think it's a, a pretty easy to read message and it's it's a movie that likes to and i don't know like it's it's weird because on some level i respect this you're rarely told what anybody's doing what their motivations are but i do think it's all there visually it's just Man, that makes it really hard to watch. It it just makes it a chore. Well, and so, so part of the problem I have with this movie and what I have with Ridley Scott in general is that, like, it, there's this weird middle ground between not knowing what the fuck's happening and it being really in your face about what the fuck's happening. And I think it gets broken up and it, it loses me because it does this thing in between where every time a character shows up, they have to go on this weird diatribe about some weird analogy, metaphor, story, moral lesson thing that means fuck all for 10 minutes, and then we get back to the plot of the movie. And it's all there for, like, quote-unquote subtext that never works. Yeah, Literally every character we're introduced through through the counselor has this 10-minute speech about nothing. Mm -hmm. Javier Bardem, I feel like he has, like... He at least has two, but I'm pretty sure it feels like there's three different scenes where he just rambles about, like, weird sexual encounters with Michael Fassbender for just, like, five minutes before they get to the point of what they're there for. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can, can we talk about that? Can we talk about how I don't think Ridley Scott understands what sex is? <laughs> I want to talk about Ridley Scott directing some of the scenes in this movie because I can't imagine it happening in my head at all. Like... What was he doing? Like, I, I have this impression that I've been doing. <laughs> He's just like, all right, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. Um, Michael, you're going to go down. You're going to eat a pussy, and you're going to do it really well. And uh, she's going to, you know, she's going to ask you to finger fuck her afterwards. And uh, you're going to be a robot when you do it. And 
make sure that... you really eat the pussy. Like what? Like how does he shoot that scene? That opening sex scene is the most awkward forced thing ever. But then in the middle of the movie, when they're just flirting on the phone, barely flirting, like the most tame fucking flirting ever. And he's like, "Is this phone sex?" Yeah. Like, dude, come on. You're Michael Fassbender. You've definitely had more intense sex than that. That's the thing. Like, it just... Haley watched this with me because, of course, and we just sit there through the opening scene. She's like, oh, God, what the fuck is this? Like, Fifty Shades of Grey? I'm like, no. I wish. That would be at least fun to watch. Like, like Vine Rasco, pick bad movies. Torture me all you want. But, like, can they at least be fun bad movies? <laughs> Can we oh, watch, like, fun. Troll 2? <laughs> that's so much fun. <laughs> I, love I have so much fun first... reading into the themes of white sheets and the most awkward sex scene ever. Yeah, it's like, it's just like, <laughs> just... Why, why even is stuff happening in this movie? Like, okay, so oh. we, we talked about uh, Big Nothing a couple weeks ago now. And Steve, like, kind of introduced that movie as a crime thriller, and I made the argument it's also a bit of a noir, this is much more a crime thriller, but without any of the thrill and very little of the crime. <laughs> um, it is kind yeah. of a crime that it got made, I guess. I mean, there's Oh, that. fucking God, that's the movie quote right there. That's the... <laughs> it's a crime that this movie was made. Woo! Zing! Um, God, it was... I, so boring. I don't understand how anyone watched this. I don't understand how he spent, what, six months of his life filming it. It's weird. It's dedicated to somebody at the end, too. Yeah, because, oh, okay, so, so interestingly enough, and this makes me feel bad because I'm going to make fun of it so much, but um, they, Ridley Scott had to stop production on this movie for like a month because his brother committed suicide. Um, and then one of the assistant directors on the movie also died during the production of the movie, so it's dedicated to both of them. Mm-hmm. Um, which tragedy? Fine, I understand, but also fuck this movie. Yeah, it's it's that weird thing of like, oh, well, something sad happened with it, so you can't say anything bad about it. No, no, you you very much can. <laughs> you, uh, yeah, yeah, really though. Fuck this movie. <laughs> <laughs> like you can you can easily still say bad things about a movie. Uh, the piece does have to stand on its own at the end of the day. Um, and you know, it's just it's one of those things like watching this. I I was certainly bored. I certainly didn't enjoy this movie. It wasn't as bad as some of the other stuff I've had to watch, so I got through it on that level, but that is by no means a compliment. I would never, ever want to watch this movie. I would never sit down to watch this movie again, but I guess I'm grateful. Recommend it. So. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'm grateful that I've seen it because, you know, ever since I was a young lad, I always wanted to see Cameron Diaz fuck a car. And guess what? I like. I, I don't know. Like, what was the point of that scene? What I, 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 that's like that's the thing about this movie is like I have certain movies that I almost love because I feel like by like the mere joy I get out of like recommending them to people and not telling them anything about them and just like getting to talk to them about what they watched afterwards. I love that so much that this movie to me just like it's one of those great movies where I show it to people and then afterwards we get to talk about how how she fucks a car and it's just so awesome. <laughs> <sighs> the thing what what was that thing called the bolito or something like that that weird fucking thing that like partially decapitates Brad Pitt at the end yeah. of the movie is well, kind of badass. They called it like um. A yeah, bolo, a bolo or like yeah, a, a bolo. bolo tie or something like that. Something yeah. like that. I don't know. It's weird. It's funny. I have no idea where it comes from, but it's hilarious. Yeah. Well, like that, that seems awesome. <laughs> I love that. It really is. He's just kind of wiggling on the ground, and his fingers get chopped off. It's well, like I love that he just starts screaming "fuck you" because he knows he's dead. You know. Yeah. That I was love... that was cool. That's such a Ridley Scott scene too. It's true. Like. This really dry movie, and then all of a sudden, there's like this really crazy, like saw level, like head decapitation scene, and you're just like, I feel really satisfied watching that. Like that just made me feel good right there. And then it was all the car fucker behind everything. Oh my. Yeah. I mean, if nothing else, the biggest thing I can say about this movie is that it is from beginning to end a Ridley Scott movie. It's got the kind of 
very in-your-face dry symbolism at the beginning. It's got the quote-unquote poetic references throughout. Um, the kind of fatalistic ending with all the main characters either dying or being miserable. Um, the way it's shot. The the only thing in this movie that he doesn't do that he does in all of his other movies is a bizarre long close-up of an eye. Or if he did that in this movie, I don't remember because I was okay. Like, it probably happens in the scene where they're looking at the diamonds. There's probably a shot of like someone's eye in the yeah, magnifying it's there. lens. It's, no, it's it's there. It's when he's looking at the um, it's when he's looking at one of the diamonds. It, it uh-huh. goes from focusing on his eye okay. and, and half his face to the diamond. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So never mind. So yeah, then it hits all the checklist moments in a Ridley Scott movie. Yep. Yep. And I'm not a huge Ridley Scott fan. I know Rasco loves Alien to death. I just think I think it's a well-made movie. I don't think it's good. And you know, the only Ridley Scott movie that I like is The Martian. But it's not I mean, really the directing in that. It's more just the the story. You know. Uh, I mean, I'm always going to say Alien and Blade Runner are two of the best films of all time, and I think Gladiator is really good. Um, yeah, I'll give but Gladiator otherwise, otherwise Ridley Scott's not my kind of director. Did he do Hannibal? Yeah, Did he? Or no, he did. Um... The one that we recasted, uh, what's yeah, that's name? that's Hannibal. Okay, yeah, mm, yeah, they did. Okay, yeah, okay. I liked Hannibal too. Yeah, he did. I'm sorry. Um, he did that I, Robin Hood movie too, didn't he? That was yeah, not... that was eh, that wasn't much. Um, I mean, I'll I'll give it this. At least it had a Robin Hood who used an English accent, but that's, that's true. That's I mean, I like Russell Crowe in that movie, if nothing else. Yeah. I don't know, like, he does a lot of this stuff, though, where he he's kind of just wanders around filmmaking for a while. Like, he's one of those guys who's never going to quit, but... He's a tornado of, like, random quality. So, like, within the tornado somewhere, the elements exist to create, like, an m- amazing film. And so, and so it's just, like, a random array of things being thrown out of a tornado and sometimes they're really good and sometimes they're really bad and sometimes they're really weird and sometimes they're really weird and really bad but sometimes they're really weird and really good and you just have to take what you can get that's why i love ridley scott he's like some sort of like machine at like a quarter machine at like a diner or something you don't know what kind of gumball or whatever you're gonna get out it's crazy that's ridley scott the same guy that made alien made Thelma and louise who made G.I. Jane, who made Robin Hood, who made this thing. Yeah. It's a very bizarre filmography, if nothing else. Yeah. yeah. And then, like, I don't know, there's just some... I feel like there's completely irrational decisions that the characters make in this movie. Like, yeah. okay, Michael Fassbender is working with the cartels, and, and he's wrapped up in drug stuff. That's obviously never a good life. But, like, they... They know that someone had to be inside the operation to kind of take it down and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But they just instantly put a hit out on everybody? I mean, like, I'm sure that they're probably all going to die, but, like, wouldn't they want to know who was responsible before they start killing everybody? I don't know. I mean, (sighs) that's the the weird thing, right? Because, like... That doesn't entirely gel with Cameron Diaz being, like, the main bad guy by the end of the movie? Yeah. Like, it doesn't. It's like, it, how it, could she know that? How could she know that, like, everybody is going to be gone after? Why wouldn't she assume that, hey, maybe they're going to, like, capture these two and ask them who did it? Well, and there's also just, like, really weird... Like, I don't, even getting past, like, more of the the intricacy of, like, the mystery or whatever, um, even just, like, the straightforward plot is really weird and confusing with that yeah. whole, like, this deal is going to give you a 4,000% return. I'm like, what? I don't, and then there's that weird dialogue exchange about, like, so if you cross money from one country past the international dateline, does it gain a, a day's worth of interest? No, of course yeah. not. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Don't you think everyone would do that if that was the case? <laughs> See, I didn't even think of that. I was like... Why would was... you even ask that? No, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go into work and I'm going to ask these two fucking morons I work with that question. And they're going to sit there for the <laughs> entire day 
and debate argue. about that. Yeah. They are going to sit there and, and sit and go, yeah, yeah, I think they do. Like, okay, Steve, you, I, I, I need to share this with someone, so I'm going to share it with you because this will be more fun to talk about. <laughs> um, so, like, to your estimation, being the, the aesthetics guy you are, what is just undoubtedly the worst genre of music? If you have to condemn an entire genre of music, what is it? Uh, I have to condemn an entire genre of music. Like there um, is nothing here. Nothing. Country. Country. I will save country for Devil Went Down to Georgia, Johnny Cash. I would save country for them. I condemn the genre of hip-hop. I'm going to repeat those words. I condemn the entire genre of hick hop. This is country music <clears throat> blended with hip hop beats. And it is undeniably the worst thing ever. And a guy I work with listens to it. And unsurprisingly, oh, he's a fucking moron. <laughs> um... <laughs> And so I'm going to ask him this question. If you transfer money across the international date line, does it gain a percentage of interest? And I swear to God, that motherfucker, along with the motherfucker who sits there all day debating with me about God knows what and saying words like litness, bro. Litness? Yes. Endlessly, those two motherfuckers are the the kinds of idiots that would have this conversation. So I totally bought that line of of two idiots talking about something like that. I mean, that one it, worked for me. If we're working with the assumption that everyone in this movie is an idiot, which they kind of are, then yeah, I guess it's fine. I mean, like, just honestly, he goes, "Oh, well, I'm gonna go tell his mother that he's dead," and, he's, and Brad Pitt goes, "Oh, well, she put a hit out on you." Yeah, but, like, wouldn't the act of going to tell her that he's dead kind of show that he probably wasn't involved? Like, okay, sure, he he was connected to the operation, and somewhere on his side of things, things went wrong, and the cartel had to rush to get their money back. End of the day, the cartel still got their money and their drugs. Um... I'm sure that they're probably never going to do business with him again. They might, like, torture him for it. But I just have a really hard time believing that they're going to, like, kill him, inst- like, instantly put out a hit on him the second something goes wrong. That's just... I mean, you know, th- they talk about it. These guys are businessmen. All the cruelty, all the evil tactics and stuff, that's just part of their business. You know? Which I think think is part of brad speech brad pitt's really annoying and rambly speech when he first shows up yeah so that's the, that's the other thing we're like i so it's like the first two or three scenes as boring and as dry and as as Awkward. overtly textual as opposed to subtextual the themes were i thought there was some really interesting potential in the way brad pitt was talking about the drug cartel and kind of the whole notion of like they act violently in very passionate ways, but the reason behind it is ultimately very dispassionate, and I thought that was something cool to play with. Um, and then you have that scene with the snuff film of, of of his girlfriend, and like he's just breaking down, crying, and it's just the idea of it. Um, well, like they know where that's... he is. What, like, do they just want to torture him in that way? What, why? Well, yeah. See, that's the thing, right? Because like it's it's a cool idea, but like the way that. The way Fassbender's acting in this plot and the way the cartel is acting in this plot, they are really inconsistent about whether or not this is, like, a vendetta or if it's just business. Yeah. Like, I really don't understand that. Like, okay, they know... They obviously know where he is. They obviously know that he didn't know what was happening. That, like, who betrayed them. Okay, fine. He is, like, obviously fucked in your book. Fine. Whatever. But, like... How can you, like, just kidnap his wife, torture her, and kill her, and then send him the tape? Chainsaw her head off and dump her body on a freaking... Did you guys see that, or is that just in the extended cut? I'm not sure. No, no, I saw that. Uh, I didn't see that, no. 
I okay, so... saw her body get dumped. I didn't see her, like, Oh, no, her tortured. head doesn't get chainsawed off on, like, screen. I'm just saying, like, that's what happened to her, I'm assuming. Doesn't Javier Bardem talk about that's what happens to them? That's uh, what so... I thought, yeah. yeah. But when yeah. I saw the body, I didn't see something. Head, so... I don't know if it was a chainsaw or not. It might have been a chainsaw. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's just me. Yeah, just, I don't know, like, what's <laughs> the... What is the point if it's business? Like, okay, you're gonna let him live, I guess? That's weird. The, part of the difficulty is that, like, we don't get to see Fassbender actually do his job for most of this movie. Yeah. Well, like, we, we know what he's... We know what he's ostensibly uh, supposed to be doing. Um, and then there are, like, minor scenes where, like, he's with clients and stuff, but, like, yeah. Fassbender as a counselor doesn't really come through in any of his relationships with any of the characters that are either trying to kill him or he's helping. And so, like, I don't entirely know at any moment how connected he is to any of this or how much he knows or how much anyone else knows. It's, it's really it's weird. Really bizarre. It introduces, like, the, the a weird thing about this movie is that it introduces all of its characters by just, like, having them walk in and start talking. And it, you never see the characters do, like, what identify, like, what they identify, like, you never see the characters doing the thing that they're ultimately, like, important to the story for. So, like, for example, in the movie, like, Baby Driver, the beginning of the movie, Baby is, is a driver, and you see that, like, right in the, but, like, this movie doesn't, like, have scenes where it's, like, yeah, Javier Bardem is, like, a big drug kingpin. You see him do something like that. It's just, like, he's there, and I can see people watching this movie and being, like, why is that guy just dressed really weird? And like not really picking up like even what's what they're talking about. I know people that literally they wouldn't even understand that they're talking about selling drugs or anything like that. I mean, I had a hard time getting my head around exactly what they were doing and when. It is it, all, yeah. It is a this is an interesting attempt to tell a story, a very complex and convoluted story through almost entirely visuals. Like the conversations that are had in this movie maybe three or four of them are directly connected to the plot and sequence of events. That's about it. And like, also Brad Pitt's just kind of a dick. Like he knows, he knows everything that's happened and everything's about to spiral out of control. And he just like keeps saying it's in the paper. It's in the paper. I'm like fucking serious, dude. It's really odd because I feel like from the beginning he doesn't really have an idea of what's what this is going to entail, and then randomly he just starts acting like his like he ha- he knew from the very beginning. It's really bizarre. Um, same with Javier Bardem. Just... Javier Bardem it does this thing in the movie where like almost none of his dialogue is relevant. So about halfway through, I just start fixating on what's wrong with his hair, and then I completely lose track of what the hell he's doing in scenes. <laughs> well, like, it's it's also weird because he has all these stories throughout the movie, and yeah. then the only story that's, like, intercut with actual footage of <laughs> the event is Cameron Diaz fucking a car. Yeah, it's so Because weird. we need to see that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every little boy growing up wanted to see Cameron Diaz fuck a car. Um, no, but, like, it's 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 just bizarre filmmaking because, well, why don't you show that? You know, like, every other scene he talks about is, you know, just a funny story that he has. Why not show those just for consistency's sake? If you're going to spend the time of him talking through it, why not just visually show it? Why just yeah. have a scene with Javier Bardem walking around in an empty nightclub that is not... Like, he even admits, because it's not lit right, it looks all shit right now. Well, <laughs> why is it on film for like 10 minutes then? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh yeah, Ridley Scott, he may not he might not have the best quality movies, but like they usually are all really shot well and look really great. Not that fucking scene. That scene it's was a... entirely pointless. There there was a point where because i don't actually own this movie and when you when you when you watch things online you have to be kind of wary of just the quality of the cut you're watching uh-huh. but like i i have that minor freak out moment every now and then where like 
oh, the is the is the is this an audio problem with the person who uploaded it, or is it on my end, or is it just the movie? Yada yada yada. When we got to that Cameron Diaz scene, I had to like stop and check the Wikipedia to make sure that this was still the movie. <laughs> an SNL skit or something. It was really bizarre. It's shot so differently from the rest of the movie. It even sort of like almost goes tonally out of sync and I had no idea what was happening. Yeah, and he's just sitting there he's like, oh, well, I I took my socks off and wiped the shit <laughs> yeah. ah. Like, what the fuck was that? And then Michael Fassbender is like, did she come? I'm like, what? Ah. What is this- happening right now? And then he's like, "Oh, it was too, it was too uh, gynecological to be sexy, almost." I'm like, "What does that sentence even mean? <laughs> what did any of those sentences mean? <laughs> that is some of the worst dialogue I have ever seen." Guys, I think I have my nomination for the greatest gif of all time. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> just, just Cameron Diaz fucking the car, and then like this shot of Harvey Everdell looking up, and he's like. This is, um, awkward, guys. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about this, y'all. Ugh. I don't know how Cameron Diaz felt about that. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those things, like, could you imagine if Ridley Scott was not the name he was, and, he at- and, like, this was his first major studio film with, like, name actri- actors, and he's like, okay, Cameron Diaz, I'm gonna want you to fuck this car. Uh, come again? <laughs> uh, so, so here's the thing, right? A traditionally attractive woman doing sexual acts to a traditionally understood as sexy vehicle like a Ferrari in some context could be really clever and subversive and interesting symbolism. This is just stupid. Yeah. Like, I don't it, know. Like, it's I'm just... not that... Like, it's not like any one of these scenes or any one of these ideas in these movies fundamentally don't work or something. It's just that collectively and textually, none of it makes any sense. I don't know. Like, I don't even, I can't even think about it on that level. I'm just still in shock of the the entire bizarreness of the scenario. Like, the only thing I have to compare it to is remembering one time in high school hearing a conversation that a guy was having about how he's never going to this person's party again because when he was there, some chick fucked a doorknob. And Whoa. Yeah, and I just, like, you know, it's just one of those things. It's just, that's always going to be in my head after I heard that, right? I'm never going to be able to get that imagery out of my head now, and now neither are you, um, because it's just such a specifically bizarre thing. And... I, I don't I can't even think about it on a thematic or contextual or, or character level because it's just such a specifically bizarre thing to show in your film that I don't I don't know what you're trying to say because all, no one's going to be able to like people that have had to have lived a crazy fucking life and been to some crazy ass parties to be able to see this and not just dwell on the visual of it and be able to interpret it on a deeper level in my opinion yeah i mean i i honestly feel like by the time you get to that ferrari scene honestly by the time you get to any scene with javier bardem it's really hard to stay in that world and you just kind of remember oh yeah i'm watching a movie now and i don't understand what's happening it's like so i love spy movies spy movies are great spy movies always have this problem of they establish you need to get from point a to point b in the beginning and by the time you get to point B by the end of the movie, you really have no idea how the fuck you got there. Um, and rarely, if ever, does it make any sense. But it's okay, because every step along the way is either really engaging or just entertaining and just specific enough that going along that path, you're not actively questioning it until they make you. With this, it's really clear at points where this is a person making a movie for you to sit there and contemplate and it just rips me right out of it um this is my this was my big problem with alien covenant too where like there are scenes that exist entirely because ridley scott wants to explain a theme to you Mm -hmm. 
Um, and this is a similar thing, like, except this... in the opposite direction in a lot of ways. Yeah, well, it's it's really weird because that's become more of a, a in thing that I think Ridley Scott didn't used to do, but now, like, that, you know, Dark Knight ruined everything. Um, because Dark Knight did it really well, and then everyone wanted to have some kind of big explanation of the themes and this, like, you know, intense dialogue about what all of these these characters mean to the world and all this stuff. And, like, you know... It worked in Dark Knight and begins and to a lesser extent in Rises because, you know, we hadn't been doing it left and right for years and years. And I mean, honestly, it's even debatable as to how well it works in Dark Knight because a lot of people will even submit that, like, that's a perfect movie except for the themeizing at the end. I, I wouldn't even want... I don't even want to touch the argument. I'm just saying, like, that was clearly the thing where it made a bunch of money and then everyone was like, okay, people like it when you explain the theme. And so now everything fucking does it, along with superhero movies where the villain has a plan to get captured. Um, yeah. Yeah, but that's like, annoying. It really is. Like I, I enjoy Civil War too, but there's <laughs> there's a point where I'm like, come the fuck on with this. <laughs> um, but well, like, no, I, I I think it's fine in Civil War because Civil War he didn't plan to get captured. Yeah. Like that was a very different thing. But anyway. Well, like, I mean, plan to, you, you know, never mind, I don't want to get off track. But, like, this this whole idea of, of getting everything, uh, getting these big dialogue-heavy scenes where it's just everyone explaining the themes and, and explaining what the characters mean to one another and how they interact. Yeah. And, like, just everything's become that now. And it's like, guys, it worked because it was the exception that explained the text and made it overt. There's still such a thing as subtext. And this movie, like, tries so hard to just have these these parables told and treat them like they're subtext. But it's like, no, that's just the text of your movie now. And so your movies are just... The, your movies is just really long sequence of thinly veiled stories that explain the themes of your movie. Did either of you guys watch... What's it called? Um, that Scarlett Johansson movie. Um, Lucy. Did, you, did either of you watch Lucy? No, it looked really stupid. Okay, no, it was. It, it was really, really stupid. But um, Lucy does this thing where she will, like, wear clothing that's specific animal fur, and then as things are happening in the movie, the movie will cut to scenes of an animal in the same color scheme doing a thing that's, like, symbolic of what's happening. So, like, for example, she'll be in, like, like I don't know brown fur that looks like a deer and then when she's being captured the movie randomly cuts to like a deer being stalked by a lion and then at some point when she becomes a badass it reverses and like she'll wear like a a jaguar striped thing and then you'll see like a jaguar hopping out of something and eating a horse or some shit like that um just like in in the most literal possible way, explaining to you what is happening as it's happening and thinking it's really clever about it. Um, the big problem with doing something like that is one, when you do symbolism, you're you have to assume two things. You have to assume one that the internal structure of your movie supports the symbol you're setting up, and two, that the audience watching the movie is going to be able to connect those structures so that w the symbol in their context and the symbol in your movie's context line up. The moment you start overselling those connections, it stops becoming a symbol and just becomes text. And yeah. It, and we really need to stop doing that, particularly when it comes to, like, let me tell you a story That'll explain some important theme later on down the line. Because the moment a character does that, we've almost become conditioned to recognize that now this is set up in payoff. To the point where, like, there is no emotional stake to it. When Alfred talked, had that whole story about some men just want to watch the world burn in Dark Knight, it worked because up to that context, that story makes sense. And then it just so happens that it makes sense for the rest of the movie. We don't do that anymore. In this movie in particular, we have people giving speeches that make no fucking sense, and by the end of the movie, they maybe do, or even if you want to be as charitable as possible, they do only in by the end of the film, but that's not how people talk. 
That's not how any of this actually works. You don't just come up with an anecdote in a random context that's suddenly going to be relevant like three weeks later. No, Steve. See, I have a story to tell you that will make you realize just how wrong you are. You see, there was a chicken and an egg. And, no, like, you're right. You're right. You know, we don't we don't just tell these like when people tell stories in conversation in real life, they rarely have a ton to do with what's going on beyond just an immediate. Oh, that reminds me of this time like I did earlier. The the scene of i'm gonna fucking dwell on this and we're not getting away from it just so you're aware the scene of cameron diaz fucking the car i just connect it to that moment from my life i the the other moment i connect it to and maybe this is just more blase for ridley scott since he's been in hollywood for so long that he's seen shit like this and so he's desensitized to it but like the the other story i'm reminded of of like apparently someone gave the members of led zeppelin an octopus a live big ass octopus and they just put it in a hotel tub and a groupie got in the tub with it and the octopus fucked her and i'm like that's just like a a story that i'm told that i've heard and i I have no idea if it's true Mm -hmm. or not but like i imagine shit like that happens in hollywood all the time where like someone does something really outrageous at, at a party and like ridley scott's just seen stuff like that but beyond just the, the fact of, like, telling a story to connect to a thematic thing, it's not that people don't tell anecdotes. It's that they don't have the perfect anecdote, anecdote for every situation. So not only do we get anecdote after anecdote and after anecdote anecdote in this story. Anecdote in this story. I need an anecdote for this story. Um, <laughs> we get them, and they all have these interconnecting thematic points, and that's just not real. Like... She, fucking the movie ends with Cameron Diaz sitting there telling a story about seeing the the uh, leopards uh, or cheetahs, whatever, fucking catching prey out in the desert. I'm like, okay, that would be the only story you need. That's That should be the only story in the entire fucking movie. Everything else should be normal conversations. If we actually cut all of the random arbitrary story dialogue from this movie, I guarantee you it would be only like 90 minutes long, if that. Well, it was funny, I love you know, that I was, cut I was, of the was, film. Yeah. Really, the really weird too. shit. Just like opening sex scene, cheetah scene, any scene with like any sort of thing that's sexual, murder scenes, dead body with no head at the very end in the, in the, in the landfill, and then end. Yep. Great movie. Yeah. Yep. It's intense, if nothing else. I'm just on the <laughs> Wikipedia page for this because, like, I actually need to reread paragraphs to remember what the fuck happened. Um, but th- this just kind of tells you. Sometimes I like going to Wikipedia for movie summaries, particularly of movies that are bad or really vague, because the only way for you to summarize the movie is to assume certain things. Um, Spectre was kind of like this, where like the Wikipedia for it just had to make stuff up, or else there was no way to summarize what the hell happened in that movie. Um, <laughs> there's a sentence here. That says, Hefe darkly and mordidly advises the counselor to resign himself irrevocably to the choices he made long beforehand, speaking philosophically. Yep. Like, even that that sentence is trying to summarize what this movie is, and even that's being really vague. It doesn't entirely know what just happened. Yeah, like, I don't understand that scene. Like, I'm assuming this is the, the big boss of the whole operation that the counselor fucked up. Okay. Yeah. What? he's just so fucking dispassionate and like doesn't even seem to be even remotely interested in getting this guy or killing this guy or tormenting this guy. He's like, no, this is just your fucking bed. Now you gotta lay in it. And I'm gonna explain it to you in the most roundabout way possible. And it like, really... Sorry, go ahead. I'm like, why? <laughs> it really confuses me when you get to that moment where like... So technically, Brad Pitt's in charge. I don't entirely understand why Michael Fassbender's even the main character of this movie and why he talks to the drug cartel guy on the phone. Yeah. Like, I don't... It's just really bizarrely structured, right? Like, if Michael Fassbender is supposed to be a guy who gets in over his head, why does everything sort of, like, depend on the people above him? It's really... It's just an odd structure. Yeah, and, like, I, I mean, can we just talk a little bit about the plot? So Cameron Diaz's character somehow 
arranges for this truck to be stolen and and you know all that and so i believe that her plan or i'm i'm meant to believe that the the plan of the person who's orchestrating events was to steal the drugs okay sure that blows up when the cartel pulls the truck over and gets it back and and it gets to its destination um so then her plan is to follow Brad Pitt, pay someone to seduce and steal from him, and then take that money and or steal information from him, then kill him, take his computer, use that information to steal all his money that he'd put away for himself. That has to be the backup plan. There's no way you could plan for that. There's no way you could plan for, okay, this is going to blow up. And the cartel's going to get their money back, but then I'm going to kill Brad Pitt. How could you possibly plan for that scenario? How do you know that Brad Pitt's got all the mon- all of his money stashed away when you apparently have had no interaction with him? She intuition. just seems to kind of, yeah, intuition. She just seems to kind of know random things whenever the plot requires her to. It's really bizarre. Like, they, we're, we're told, oh, she's a really smart woman, but that's just the thing. We're told that. We never see her do anything really smart besides look at a diamond and know how much it's worth. This is this the is... only point in the entire film where she shows any level of intelligence. Speaking of Big Nothing and this, and actually a lot of movies that we talk about on Geeky Gentlemen, there always seems to kind of end up being... If not a big twist, some sort of twist at the end, and we always kind of like stop and talk about how viable that twist is. I'm going to go ahead and say that ultimately, for a twist to be effective, it doesn't necessarily have to make sense so much as it has to change the dynamic of the story to where the themes are all still coherent and it raises the stakes. This does neither. It actually the the themes of this as they are in their vague general i don't completely understand terms sort of disappear by the end when she becomes the main mad guy and all of the tension is entirely deflated because i have no idea how the hell any of thing anything adds up because of her so again i don't necessarily need this plot to be 100% clear as much as i just need some fucking reason to believe why it's okay that she's the main bad guy Mm -hmm. i don't know rasco you've been quiet take us somewhere on this well i was gonna say that i feel like this is one of those movies where you could almost like take everything that it's about strip it from what actually happens and attach it to like three different kinds of stories almost like Oftentimes, there are conversations that people will have where they literally are just talking about men and women and like relationships. And I, I have yet to be, I can't see where that and in any way connects to any of the other themes that are sometimes brought up in con- conversations that they will later have, or sometimes things that they will talk about later in that exact same conversation. That are like, I really, they will like sometimes be talking literally about sex but then about completely other things. And, and like, I, it's really, really strange. And I feel like the movie almost is, like, very... Like, I feel like a lot of the questions that, about things that you don't know if they make sense or not, I feel like they don't really know the answers to, and they're, like, left just kind of vague, so, like, there could be an explanation. But the movie is very much not concerned with what's happening there, it feels like. It really feels like it's only concerned with the things that are literally being discussed in most of the conversations that are being had. Yeah. yeah. Which is weird. And, <laughs> Which... like, I don't know. See, I kind of... I'm, I'm of two minds on that. I kind of like the idea of just having characters having, you know, normal for them conversations. Like, you know, so often we we get wrapped up in this idea that everything has to serve a purpose. And like, I don't know, I kind of enjoy that about, like, clerks, that the dialogue doesn't necessarily... Every single scene of dialogue doesn't really revolve around taking taking the characters of the movie somewhere. Sometimes it's just characters having a conversation that totally seems viable for these characters but like that's what every scene in this movie is 
with but very it's few weird exceptions. Thing because, like, they're talking about these things, like, still, like, they're talking about, like, the more, like, philosophical ideas that are, like, they're talking about, like, her fucking a car in, like, philosophical terms. Mm-hmm. That's not, that's not normal. <laughs> like, if no, I'm... it's really not. That's not normal. Like, you don't have a conversation with, like that in the same, like, just tone. It's just, like, a completely different thing. And... That's what's different. And I also do like scenes that sometimes don't necessarily matter. Maybe they don't even serve the plot, but it serves some sort of like character thing or who knows. I like that. And I can have just meaningless conversations. But what's weird is that they'll oftentimes talk about things with and like it almost seems like, yeah, this is as important as all that other stuff. But it also seems completely unrelated. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's. It's hard to watch movies like this because everyone is clearly trying their damnedest. But man, oh man, is this just painful to sit through. And I mean, there's definitely got to be some sort of like good faith from the studio and the actors when they all agree to this, right? Like some of the, some of these people weren't as big of names then as they are now, but like Toby Kemble's in this movie, Dean Norris is in it, John Leguizamo's in it, Brad Pitt, Cameron Diaz, Javier Bardem, Michael Fassbender. Like it's um, that woman from Game of Thrones. Like it's it's a really big cast. It's a really Natalie powerful Hummer. cast, right? Her. Um, I don't watch Game of Thrones, but I just recognized her face. Um, but it's a really big cast. It's a really talented cast. It's some of the best actors that are working right now all together. And Ridley Scott, as, as much as his filmography sort of slants towards the incomprehensible side as opposed to the good side, um, he's a really talented guy. And he knows how to tell stories. It just seems like he got caught up way too much in his head with this particular plot, um, and none of the actors felt like they needed to reel it in because they just kind of implicitly trusted everyone else that it was going to be okay. And it wasn't. Yeah. You know, it was funny when Dean Norris, uh, the guy that played um, Hank in this in uh, Breaking Bad showed up and he's like, I'm assuming like a paid cop or something. Yeah. Um, I, for a second, I'm like, this is the prequel to Breaking Bad. <laughs> he was a dirty cop the whole time. Oh, that would make this so much more entertaining, honestly. <laughs> right it's like it's this is the cartel that that gust like killed off and so now it's run by some guy who just likes to tell stories because he was never really meant to be in charge uh it's it's all that stuff that's what's going on in this movie and this kind of explains a little bit about the dialogue problems apparently the guy that wrote this writes novels and not movies yes. this is his first actual movie script that makes so much sense. It really does. He's the guy that wrote the original No Country for Old Men book. Yeah, and like that that's a book that or that's a movie that does a lot of this shit too, right? Where it's like Exactly. Just, you know, kind of rambly things like what it's the most you've ever lost on coin toss. Like that, that awesome. whole fucking thing. Yeah. Um, but like the the thing is with No Country is it has minimalist dialogue? This has shit tons of dialogue, <laughs> but it's all of it's really, like that. Really incomprehensibly long dialogue. I tune out like thirty percent of the conversations when when Javier Bardem and Brad Pitt are talking. Well, like the conversation that I still cannot connect what the hell it has to do with the movie is with the guy talking about Spain kicking the Jews out, and <laughs> like I, it's right at the beginning of the movie. I was waiting for that to have some connection to anything. The yeah. diamonds come back up later, but like, shit, I don't know what the hell is going on in that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I actually literally just rewatched that scene before I got on this call to this review. I was watching that scene, and I'm like, yeah, what is that part about? Like, it, I have no idea. It's, it's like so bizarre because he's like, he goes from talking about Jews being kicked out of Spain, and then he talks about like the greatness of the semitic culture and how the only comparable one is like greek culture and and you know he's talking about like one god a god not god's a man of god like it is it, just incomprehensible it really is 
Like, oh man, it is just hard to watch this. Um, it's... I feel like you could do a really interesting remake. Because um, yeah. ultimately, a lot of the sort of like minimalist ideas, Michael Fassbender's character is just the counselor, um, the sort of like more complex relationship as Ridley Scott's trying to describe, describe it between the cartel and Brad Pitt and all of that. Like, I, there's something here. There's definitely something here. It's just completely incomprehensible in this version of the movie. I almost feel like you could literally just take the cast, the premise, and, like, switch it and make it, like, a Tarantino movie, and it would work with the exact oh, same cast. Yes. Oh, my God, Tarantino would be so yes. much better for this movie. He really would. That's, that's perfect. Because Tarantino knows how to shoot dialogue and conversations. Really, yeah, here's the thing. Ridley Scott's really good at shooting visual symbolism and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Like, like Rid- Ridley Scott is very much a visual director, whereas Tarantino is a dialogue director. Um, and, you know, obviously he's he's still got the visual side of it down, too. He knows how to do interesting angles because he steals them from people. Um, <laughs> Ridley Scott invents interesting angles, but Tarantino's heart and soul is in dialogue. And so with a movie as dialogue heavy as this... Tarantino would just know how to shoot that better. I mean, as the guy that opens a movie talking about tips for like 10 minutes, and it's fucking hilarious and perfect. Yes, oh my god, I love the the Mr. Brown I don't tip scene. Yeah, the I mean, best. <laughs> it really is. That guy can make these conversations comprehensible. It is. And I, I guess part of the thing is, like, Tarantino's stuff is a lot more blue-collar. This is kind of, like, high life. Um, That's fair. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Even still, though. Like, it's... Again, the, there's something here. I I enjoyed glimmers of this movie. Um, Michael Fassbender doesn't really get anything to do except for a couple of scenes. Um, but it's clear that, like, Brad Pitt's kind of having fun and Javier Bardem's having fun. Mostly because I think he must have been on drugs to get that haircut. Um, but <laughs> he's married to Penelope Cruz. That's How true. awkward is it that they're both in this movie, considering the scenes that they're in? Like, what the That's heck? True. You know, I, like, I this... have to imagine Cameron Diaz and the Ferrari were having fun, but like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this. All right, all right. Here's here's a question I have about specifically casting Cameron Diaz for this, and this might verge on like. I, I'm probably going to get called a sexist for this, but whatever. Um, I don't particularly find Cameron Diaz very attractive. Uh, and so maybe this is just for me on a personal level. I have a hard time buying that, like, this is the woman that can worm her way inside of this uh, criminal enterprise to tear it down from within and and make out on her own ruthless way based almost entirely on her you know quote-unquote feminine wiles i have a really hard time buying her as the character that's gonna pull all that off see i would i wouldn't doubt her ability to do it it's just so much of like that kind of characterization comes not only in like actual physical attraction but also in how that character is written and directed and kind of like can talk their way out of scenarios and stuff and she never does that Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it's. I don't think she's miscast as much as she's just completely underutilized. Maybe because like she's like that in the mask, right? Yeah. She was also, as far as I'm aware, a former porn star. So maybe she was the only actress of this level of notoriety willing to fuck a Ferrari. That's a fair. Movie. I That's... wouldn't buy that. I mean, you could get <laughs> other actresses to do shit like that. Um, I don't know. I I. I watch this and I'm just like, I don't, I don't think Cameron Diaz be the one to like go for, for that role. Like, honestly, I feel like, um, Penelope Cruz and Cameron Diaz should switch places in this movie and I'd buy it more. Um, I feel like Penelope Cruz has too much of like a vacant, innocent face for a lot of that. Maybe that would have made the twist work better. Actually. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I didn't, I didn't buy that. She would be able to pull all this off. Um, she just did not 
look that way to me. And I, I mean, I, I've always kind of not really understood the the huge attraction that people have to um, Cameron Diaz. She's obviously like a very good looking woman, just not I don't I don't know, not my type. Whatever. Um, I just I just didn't really buy that she'd be able to to pull all that off just based almost entirely on her looks like the the plot kind of wants you to believe um because like every other dem says that he's attracted to like smart women but i'm like i don't i don't think you are i really don't are <laughs> have ever dem is kind of sleazy in this whole thing yeah yeah i really don't think this is the guy who's like i love women for their brains no. Well, I think most of the time when people talk about, like, I think that's true of most people in general. Whenever you ask someone, like, what do you like in a whatever, they'll always lie. No one ever can is, like, honest with themselves about what they like. They'll tell you, they'll just lie. I feel like that's the case there. He's just like, I like really smart women. And I'm just like, no, it's not true. You're lying to yourself. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. And then, like, there's just this casual attitude that Heavy Arbor Dam has when shit's starting to go sideways. Like, yep. like he, he's just chilling by the pool when she comes home, even though he knows that the cartels are probably going to come after him. And, like, <laughs> then he's just out for what I assume is a leisurely stroll with his <laughs> cheetahs. <laughs> like, you know, sometimes you just gotta do that. I mean, I'm, I assume you have to walk a cheetah. I'll grant you that. You probably run a have cheetah. to walk a yeah, run a cheetah. Otherwise, it's likely to just turn on your ass and you know get your face mauled in the morning. Can you like this motherfucker had housekeepers? How do you be the housekeeper for a guy that owns cheetahs? Fuck you better that. pay a lot for that. <laughs> People should just not own cheetahs. Yeah, no, no, yes. I agree with that. No, I d- totally. But like. You know, he's just so cavalier about it all. He's like, oh, well, you know, they're probably going to come and kill me. Better just go walk the cheetahs real quick. Oh, no, a car is coming. This doesn't look good. Where the fuck even was he? He's just driving through some random-ass empty neighborhood. See, that's the weird thing. Because his death is sort of like the kickoff point for everything going downhill and everyone kind of losing it by the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like the most comedic, random, accidental thing. He's just like a bumbling buffoon. He's just like, oh! Oh, Like, they turn over his body and he's got this big blank expression on his face. Well, it's weird, too, because, like, he... He has the gun in his car, but he doesn't think to grab it till after they crash him. Yeah. That's bizarre to me. That whole scene was just really odd. Again, it feels like it doesn't belong in this movie. It really doesn't. It's just like, I don't know, this this movie's all over the place for me. Yeah, what I should have done. To make of it. He should have, like, unleashed the cheetahs on the other guys. Pull out that his gun. That would have been cool as shit. And then he's like, I harness the power of cheetahs. And then and he pulls out a pistol, and then he's just like, cheetah man. He's just shooting people, and he's got cheetahs everywhere. It'd be awesome. That outfit, Fit. that hair, and cheetahs plus drug cartel, he is 90% an anime character, except he never does anything. <laughs> no, 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 no. Steve, Steve. Fan casting. Have your upper time for Catman. Yes! <laughs> Are you kidding? That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I've always wanted him to be Bane, but that too. He would be an awesome Bane. He yeah. really would. Yeah, I wouldn't mind if they did like the whole skinny Bane, big Bane thing with him. That could work. They were talking yeah. about him being Frankenstein in like the uh, Dark Universe or whatever the new. Oh, like... is that still a thing? I don't know. I don't know if that's been scrapped. It seems like they keep trying, and then, like, the, every movie they launch it with just turns out not to be a very well liked movie. Yeah. Probably <laughs> was really bad. <laughs> like, well, I blame Tom Cruise for that, because Tom well, Cruise is so fair. full of himself. Um, I, I'm, ever since Vince made this post on Facebook, I'm going to cite it every time anyone ever talks about Tom Cruise. Um, <laughs> Vince made a comment saying. Um, Every Tom Cruise movie ever would be instantly improved if you replace Tom Cruise with Chris Pine. Oh my god. <laughs> it's kind of perfect. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I don't know if that's true, because I don't know if Chris Pine would do as much of the stunts that Tom Cruise does. That's fair, but he'd at least be fun to watch. Yeah. 
Uh, I like yeah. that. Oh, even okay, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is there anything else worth saying about this movie? The score oh. is really generic and blank, and I don't remember a single beat of it. It's weird because sometimes they'll just throw in a rap. Yeah, that's the thing. They just randomly throw in pop and rap mu- rap music for no good reason, and then like the actual film score is like nothing. There's a lot of hotel rooms in this movie. There really are. Yeah, I have a really hard time because like Michael Fassbender's character keeps spending like time in these really sh- fancy hotels, and like I have a really hard time telling where he lives. And when he's in a hotel. I don't know if he does live anywhere almost. I'm like, where does he live? They're just like traveling all the time. And they're just like, okay, let's randomly pick this one place to go fly and meet together. at. And it's like, okay. Do you guys have like a house? Okay, anywhere? that's another thing. When, when, when she gets kidnapped at the airport. Like, <laughs> why though? Like, she knows something's up. She doesn't think, hey, maybe I should park in a, a place where I'm clearly viewable by other people like just on some level you have to think that right i don't know Uh, how you get kidnapped at an airport (laughs) fair point how do you get kidnapped at an airport you can't bring like a freaking lighter on a plane and you can get kidnapped at an airport though yeah post 9-11 texas airport of all places yeah you're right (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there's no way. Like, just, just okay, I'm not gonna park in this parking garage where I'm the only person I see. Maybe I should, I don't know, park, like, right up the front gate. I, I don't know, it's just, like, it's, it's one of those things you just have to suspend disbelief, but this movie doesn't do enough for me to want to do that for it, you know? It's, it's a really strange thing where, like, the tone is so dark where you're, like, you'd feel like you maybe don't need the suspension of disbelief just because it's going to be really gritty and realistic. But then it's completely batshit crazy when people start talking. And then you meet Javier Bardem and you have no idea what the fuck's happening anymore. And, and like, cheetahs. And then there's cheetahs. Like, it, it's just the tone, the actual color gradient of the movie, and then the physical events do not lend themselves to any particular sense of realism or no realism. It's just, it's bizarre. Yep, I agree. This is a hard movie to watch. Really boring. I can't stress enough how boring it is. Recommend it to your friends, kids. Get it out there. Now, Rasco, I'm I'm slapping you on the wrist. You have to pick at least five things in future review topics that are nothing like this kind of movie. I think I've got a great pick that's like kind of the reverse of this where it's like the perfect blend of like story and some symbolism and themes and it's never too intrusive and it just works really well that's what i'm gonna pick next but i'm not gonna say until then okay don't worry i'll pick something i think you'll like okay thank you (sighs) let's go ahead and move on to ratings steve what will you rate this movie I'm going to give it 0.5 out of 5 what's wrong with his hair Javier Bardem haircuts. Okay. I'm going to give this 0 out of 5 vaginas pressed up against your car windshield. (laughs) I'm going to give this 3 out of 5 finger fucks. And now you're saying, what the hell, 3 out of 5? But hear me out. Here's the three things. It gets a three out of five. Fucking a car. Crazy Javier Bardem and cheetahs. And you know what? Brad Pitt getting his head cut off. That makes it a three out of five for me. Not that I hate Brad Pitt. I just love that scene. <laughs> That's how he got the scar from Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. What are we going to be talking about next week? It's me, and I need a, a discussion topic. So what can we talk about? What can we talk about? Ooh. Hmm. That's a hard one. I, I don't have anything off the top of my head. I kind of want to talk about some comic booky. Been in a comics mood lately. Um, comics. Well, it's Jack Kirby's 100th birthday. We can talk about Jack Kirby. 
a whole video on Jack Kirby? Yeah, because uh-huh. I got some yeah. stuff I can say about Jack. I've been yeah, doing I think like I... forty minute reviews of these Jack Kirby specials. I can probably do a whole episode just on Jack Kirby. Yeah, um, I'd probably have to go back and do some research because it's been a while. But like, yeah, I could talk about Jack Kirby for an hour at least. Okay, that'll work then. All right, everyone. Next week, join us as we discuss Jack Kirby. Uh, until then, I'm the philosopher. I'm the exile. And I'm the beta male cook. And we are your geeky gentlemen, and we will be discussing things.